This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 919, recorded on July 12th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. How are you today? All right. Uh, we have sunny skies and 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, my gosh. What's that? Uh, 39, maybe? Maybe 40, I'm guessing. Um, and as I look at the uh, daily forecast for the next two weeks, I don't see any temperatures below 100 degrees. And I see them going up uh, as high as 105 is the forecast for tomorrow. So there you go. Wow. I'm down in the Jersey Shore where it's 27C and pretty windy. You might see the trees moving outside the window here, given that little shadowy effect. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's a variety of temperatures. I'm now look. I've looked at six apps, but <laughs> I'm going to average them all and say that it's 82 Fahrenheit, which is 28 Celsius, and it's uh, white puffy clouds. It's a nice day. We are recording early in the week because uh, I'm traveling Friday to go to ASV, and so is everyone else probably. So. Um, <laughs> Hence, but this episode will be released on Sunday. So, uh, I have confirmed that 104 degrees is 40 Celsius. 40 Celsius. Yeah. I always remember the 37C incubator, which is what, 98.6 yeah. or 98. something? 98.6. Like <laughs> it's cool. well, I finally uh, switched um, at uh, my wife's suggestion, I've switched the temperature readings in the Tesla to centigrade. Celsius. Ah, good. Okay. So we can. Get a grip on that. As I recall, you did the same thing, Vincent. Is that right? Yeah, I, I switched it years ago in my car. And um, whenever I rarely drive my wife anywhere in my car, but when I do, she gets really mad. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you what are you doing? Because I don't know what that means. And she'll ask me the temperature and I'll get my phone. Twenty seven C. I don't know what so sometimes I have to translate it on the fly. But I still like it. I really like it. Um so Brianne will be a bit late. She'll join us any moment now, but we'll get going. And I wanted to do a brief follow-up on Paul Offit's visit, uh, which has generated a lot of conversation. And this is a post on the FDA website, which was actually before our episode with Paul. It was posted on June 30th, and it's called Update, COVID-19 Vaccine Booster Composition. And it says, you know, the FDA verb pack met and they voted in favor of including a SARS-CoV-2 Omicron component in COVID-19 vaccines that would be used for booster doses in the U.S. beginning in the fall 2022. And then it says, in consideration of the committee's vote and the discussion that took place, about the specific SARS-CoV-2 variant to include, and considering the totality of the available evidence, FDA has advised vaccine manufacturers seeking to update their vaccines that they should develop modified vaccines that add an Omicron BA.4.5 component to their current vaccine compositions to create two-component bivalent booster vaccines. So that's kind of what Paul mentioned. He said, I think they're going to do a BA4-5. And in fact, they had already announced that. Now, what I find really interesting is the last paragraph. We expect this coming year when these modified booster vaccines will be introduced to be a transitional period. So I guess it's happening, you know, despite the two op op opposing votes. Therefore, we have not advised manufacturers to change the vaccine for primary vaccination since a primary series with this vaccine provides a base of protection against serious outcomes of COVID caused by circulating strains of SARS-CoV-2. So they're still going to use the ancestral vaccine, right? Because that's what's been extensively tested and it really works well. 
So that's this is a booster. If, and people generate immune responses to variants, even yeah. if they got the ancestral yeah. vaccine. Three doses is enough to do that, yeah. So now I have a question. The bivalent BA4-5, does that mean half four and half five? Or, or mm. one or the <laughs> other and some ancestral or uh, prototype, they call it, I guess. Well, the- so the ancestral I interpret to be... I mean, the bivalent I inter- interpret to be uh, a cocktail that's got the ancestral and one of the Omicron variants. And I interpret the four slash five to be one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> Dealer's choice. Okay. Uh, but that's my, that's just my interpretation. I think that's probably it. And it's interesting that Pfizer had tested a Omicron monovalent, right? Which they found performed slightly better, but. I guess they don't want a monovalent. They want a bivalent. So. Well, I can understand some hesitancy about moving completely away from something that has been so rigorously tested and mm. that works. Okay. For sure. And I think yeah. that was that was a major part of Paul's problem. Okay. Was look, uh, sure. as as it says in the show notes, and as I was thinking during that episode, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Okay. On the other hand, I can uh, easily understand uh, the arguments for uh, incorporating a variant. Okay, so it's it's a tough problem, mm-hmm. and this is this is their decision. Yeah, and one of the things that I've come back to when I've talked to other people about this is that I, I think Paul was implying that uh, we don't know what's going to happen with bivalent vaccines. You know, we know what's going to happen with the monovalent prototype, and it's been working. So, I, and we, I mean, we don't know in a large sense. In a small sense, they've certainly they've done the the experiment of immunizing people and looking at serum. Okay, but you know, we certainly don't know in the same sort of context as we know about the ancestral strain where it was, you know, tested in cl- for clinical outcome in uh, 30,000 people per vaccine. And you can't, the, the thing that's interesting, one of the things that's interesting to me is you can't do that anymore. Well, and, and also he pointed out that then it's, these have also been rolled out to millions of people and we wouldn't have predicted, as he said, the cardiovascular yeah. complications yeah. and then the complications. Yeah. Right. So we don't know with a bivalent when we roll it out to millions, what might happen. Exactly. So I can uh, easily imagine that they'll be keeping a close eye on that. Sure. For sure. All right. So we'll look, we're going to see boosters in the fall with BA4, 5 and ancestral. And um, so when they recommend a booster, that's what you're going to get. All right. So then another aspect of what we talked about was very briefly, I just asked him, you know, does do vaccines prevent long COVID? And he said, well, what is long COVID? And that's part of the problem. And then we talked about fatigue and a lot of people get mad when we do that. And I understand. And I have two letters here that I put in, I want to read, but there were many, many more. And I just want to tell you what what I'm thinking about anyway. So the, the way these these um, the long COVID is assessed in many cases is by a questionnaire, and there are many questions. And one of them is, "Are you tired? Are you fatigued?" And I, in my opinion, that's not good enough. It's not specific enough. I don't mean to say that it's an important part of it, but there's so many other things that can cause fatigue right? That you have to somehow distinguish them. So I'm not trying to minimize that maybe part of long COVID is fatigue. I'm just trying to say that it's too nonspecific. We have no clinical test that will say you have long COVID. There are a lot of things that you're asked about, and the most common one is fatigue. And I just argue it's not specific enough. That's all I'm saying. And that we're probably capturing way more than we need to by asking that. Yeah, uh, I anticipated when that went by that there was going to be email um, because people are rightfully very sensitive to uh, this idea of 
uh, fatigue, their mm, um, experience of fatigue being dismissed right. by uh, one person or another. And this takes us back to the, you know, uh, this takes us back to uh, XMRV. Yes, absolutely. Okay? For those <laughs> new listeners who are new to this and sensitive to this, there is a whole arc. God, when was that? That must have been five or six years ago, even more. Yeah, I'd have more to look it up. Yeah. Uh, I will look it up. Um, for That went on for more than a year, right? Where there was uh, an, uh, an implication, a, a suspicion that turned out to be uh, really wrong in a really uh, partly an interesting way, partly a fraudulent way. Okay, that a virus called XMRV caused chronic fatigue syndrome. And that got us deep into chronic fatigue syndrome. And we all learned a lot about that. And one of the things we learned is to be sensitive to this idea of uh, what fatigue is and how some people experience it in a chronic fashion. And so, yeah, all that was being done in that episode uh, and apologies if it was, if, uh, some people felt hurt by it, okay, um, is to say that the definition of long COVID is squishy, okay? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it's, and understandably squishy, okay? We don't have a good definition now. Same, this is the same problem with uh, MECFS, right? Yeah, there's no, um, there's no diagnostic test you can yeah. run yet. And right. people are working on it. Yeah. And I have to say, when XMRV hit, David Tuller began to write at Virology Blog, and he continues to do so this day about MECFS and now long COVID. And his goal is to try and get people to overcome their biases. Oh, yeah, you're just tired, you know, you know, this and that. And that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to get the definition of long COVID uh, right. Uh, Brianne, hello. Hello, how are you? Oh, welcome. You're, you've got voice and you have video. Very good. Yes, I <laughs> have my tech finally working. <laughs> Thanks. Very good. Very good. So Very good. it looks like one of the first mentions of XMRV was, get this, in TWIV 50. Wow. In 2009. But that's when it was <laughs> uh, discovered as uh, being present in, uh, it being implicated in uh, prostate cancer. That's right. Uh, so, and I don't think that the association with uh, uh, CFS came up until much later. However, there's an episode, um, uh, TWIV 136 in 2011, that's titled Exit XMRV, uh, where we had uh, Steve Goff on. Yeah. And uh, that must have been pretty close to the wrap-up. And we've got other episodes here, 76, 94, uh, 113. Okay, so this went on for a couple of years. So XMRV has nothing to do with MECFS, right? It's a lab contaminant. It's actually a recombinant virus that arose in a laboratory cell line. And it's just a long series of errors that were made. Uh, and also people being very excited about a potential etiology of a disease that you know, has been recognized for a long time, afflicts millions of people and for which there's no cure in sight. And I understand that. And so for long COVID, we want to make sure we have a good definition. So we capture, the frequency is very important, right? And the numbers range from 5% to 50% uh, after infection of a vaccinated person. Which is it? And so to do that, you have to get the definition right. And that's all I mean when we when we talk about fatigue. So uh, let me read two two emails that really actually crystallized the, the argument very well. First is from Thomas. In the most recent episode with Paul Offit, the question came up what long COVID actually is. Both you and he suggested that if fatigue was a criterion, then you both would have to say that you have long COVID. I have been guilty of this cheap quip myself in the past. Okay. Yeah, I I, I get it. It's a, It's really a cheap quit. But what we should have said is, what we're trying to do is get the definition right. And then continuing with Thomas, may I suggest that you read in some five to seven minutes, Max, an entry in the blog Crooked Timber. 
that is run by a bunch of British and Australian academics. The entry is titled Settling in for the Long Haul and was posted on July 5th this year by author Maria Farrell, a well-known technology writer. You would henceforth not confuse tiredness with fatigue, which must be really grating to those who suffer from the latter. And it's a really good and moving blog post. So we'll put the link in uh, for you. And then Laurie writes... Just a quick comment in response to your discussion on long COVID, Paul Offit. The fatigue experienced during long COVID is at least the the fatigue experienced by my daughter, not your run-of-the-mill fatigue. It's more like sleeping 16 to 18 hours a day for three to four days in a row, sleeping through six alarms and not being able to concentrate when you do manage to get out of bed. I would describe this as extreme fatigue. I don't know what the criteria is for diagnosis. Maybe it needs to be better defined. And that's it. Perfectly said, Lori. It needs to be better defined. Because if you have a questionnaire and you ask people, okay, since you had COVID, have you been tired? That's not good enough, right? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I have no doubt that fatigue, is, this debilitating fatigue is maybe part of it. But I just want it to be precisely um, delineated, okay? And there are many, many more letters, most of which were not as nice as these two. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. All right. Uh, now we have a, a paper which turned out to be even cooler than I thought when I first saw it. <laughs> Actually, it's one so of the cool. things I thought uh, thought of constantly as I was reading this is that we have, I presume, still listeners that joined us for SARS-CoV-2 and we're hoping we'll stay on, okay? And for those who have, here's part of your reward because <laughs> <laughs> this, this is incredible. So this is a cell paper entitled A Volatile from the Skin Microbiota of Flavivirus Virus Infected Hosts Promotes Mosquito Attractiveness. <laughs> we're going to get get it all here. This uh, comes from... Uh, as a number of laboratories in China and also the University of Connecticut. We have Tsinghua and Peking Universities, the Institute of Infectious Diseases, the Ruiji the really Hospital of Chinese Medicine, the Yunnan Tropical and Subtropical Animal Viral Disease Laboratory, the State Key Laboratory of Infectious Disease Prevention and Control, and two first authors, Hong Zhang and Yibin Zhu. And the last author is Gong Cheng. So this is all about viruses that are transmitted between hosts and arthropod vectors like mosquitoes. And this is a complicated thing because the virus needs to reproduce in both a mammal and in an arthropod. And so you have a lot of uh, uh, variables at play here. And the, the key issue, which is what's addressed in this paper, so... A, let's say a mosquito, because that's what we talk about here. A mosquito takes a blood meal. Uh, and that host, let's say it's a human, is infected with a virus uh, where there's virus in the blood, viremia. So now the mosquito takes in some viruses and the virus reproduces in the mosquito. And then when the mosquito bites another host, it delivers the virus to that host. So that's how the virus is getting from host to host. And the super critical part of what Vincent just said, um, <laughs> if I were writing a transcript, I would write this part in capital letters, um, is that the virus has to reproduce inside the mosquito. Right. Um, so I very frequently have students ask questions about um, other viruses that are in the blood and why can't they be transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, and there does have to be this ability for the virus to reproduce in the mosquito um, so every virus in the blood cannot do this. So the idea here, and the authors say this right away, an essential vector behavior is orienting to viremic hosts with a high frequency, right? So somehow d does the vector, the mosquito, have to know, you know, know in quotes, that the host is infected? Um, and so maybe the pathogen infected host somehow is more attractive to the mosquito. And this is not unprecedented, right? Malaria induces changes that in the host that uh, attract mosquitoes. 
but we don't have much information about viruses. So do viruses alter the physiology of the host in a way that attracts mosquitoes? We actually, a long time ago, did a paper on a plant aphid virus where the aphid delivers virus to the plants, which makes it more attractive uh, to other aphids. So this is not unprecedented. Um, and the way this works is there are a couple of ways, as you'll see in a bit, but one of them is volatiles. It doesn't mean angry people. It means chemicals <laughs> <laughs> that can be produced on the skin and, and move into the air. Uh, and we have uh, information about that. So plasmodium, which I just told you uh, can can induce can uh, attract mosquitoes. Plasmodium uh, causes the production of an isoprenoid precursor that affects mosquitoes. And you can show this in mice that uh, malaria infected mice are more attractive to mosquito vectors. So in this study, they're going to ask: Is does this work for? animal viruses. They're going to use Zika virus and dengue virus, two flavy viruses. And, and, and if so, how does it work? And they do so much here, you're going to be amazed uh, at this. Um, and I thought you guys would love the, the methodology here. <laughs> so how do you do the experiments? So they have a couple of cool setups. One is a three-cage olfactometer assay. <laughs> is basically, I have to look at the picture to describe yeah. it to you. So you have three cages, box one, box two, box three. By the and way, then, this is open access, I think. It, it is, yeah. Yes. I, I got uh, it so uh, for those who are following along, uh, the, there are diagrams of all of these uh, apparatus that they yeah. use. And uh, you're talking about the one in figure 1A now, right? Figure yeah, 1A. You've got two, yeah. so they show flasks of infected mice. I'm not sure they're flasks, but whatever. There are two containers of, inf of either healthy mice or infected mice. And then there's, they blow air from them into these three uh, cages. So there's a cage in the middle where they put the mosquitoes. And then the mosquitoes can either fly to the left or the right cage if they like the air coming from the infected mice or the, the healthy mice, basically, right? So they're pushing air through these mouse cages into the two cages, and then the mosquitoes have a choice. And I think it's a one-way trip. Once they yeah. get into the box, they can't get out. So yeah. then you this can reminds them. me very much of <laughs> various um, uh, uh, Drosophila type mm -hmm. uh, test, to test for s smell or behavior in Drosophila. So they put 60 mosquitoes into the 80s Egypti. They put them in the central cage, and they can choose one or the other, right? And then they have mice, which they infect with Zika virus, or they have uninfected mice. And then they run this experiment for zero to six days because more than that, they die. And then they measure the number of mosquitoes in each cage. They can just count them. So day zero, day two after infection same ratios of mosquitoes uh, entering both chambers. But by days four and six, the number of mosquitoes in the trapping chamber next to the Zika-infected mice are preferred, 70% versus 30% in the other, which they say suggests that the mice, that the mosquitoes prefer uh, Zika virus-infected mice. And they use dengue in the same experiment. They get the same result. Uh, then they have what they call a two-port olfactometer assay to kind of get more evidence because, as Rich was saying before, they don't just do it once. They come at this from all angles. In the end, you're pretty convinced that this yeah. is what's going on. Uh, and then they have, again, two chambers of healthier infected mice. They're pumping air through them into a main chamber and – there's a screen so that the mosquitoes uh, hang out on the screen next to one of the two mouse cages, and that's the preference, right? And so they fly – so the mosquitoes are flying upwind. They actually use that phrase here. So they put the mosquitoes in, and then they fly upwind to, to smell uh, the mice. They enter a trapping chamber, and they, they go on this screen, and they – can't get any further. And so this basically confirms that mosquitoes prefer Zika and den or dengue virus infected animals to uninfected animals. 
Okay, so what's going on here? What would make a mosquito prefer an infected animal? So they say there are a couple of different things. We have carbon heat, we have carbon dioxide, and we have odor emission, where that would be your volatiles, right? <laughs> and so um, at first they look at CO2, and they see five days after Zika virus infection, they measure CO2 emission from the mice, and it's uh, it's reduced. So that's not it. CO2 is a major attractor of mosquitoes. Yeah. And in dengue virus infected mice, it's not changed <clears throat> compared to, so they rule out CO2 um, for Aedes aegypti. How about body temperature? So they they artificially increase body temperature by giving the mice lipopolysaccharide. And um, no, no, no increase in the number of mosquitoes. I thought that was really cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very simple thing. You give LPS, temperature goes up. It's not just heat. Okay, so that leaves odor. <laughs> so what they do, they have a deodorization device <laughs> that absorbs the volatiles in these chambers that they've set up. Right? Probably just like a charcoal filter or something yeah, like that. Yeah, probably. Yeah, but that doesn't and sound as cool. <laughs> yeah, I like, right. I like deodorization device. Yeah. And um, in, in this case, the ratios of mosquitoes are the same for both infected and uninfected. So they say, ah, there's an odorant of some kind, which is dictating uh, the preference. Yeah. One thing I would love to see um, in a future study, because they have done plenty here. <laughs> Uh, so certainly a future study um, is I like that they are using Aedes aegypti here, but I wonder if they used um, other types of mosquitoes that do not transmit dengue or Zika. Um, mm -hmm. Would they respond to these same volatiles or is there some specificity here that yeah, um, yeah. these viruses are attracting mosquitoes that are vectors for these viruses? So do you want them to try a mosquito that vectors other viruses or that doesn't vector any viruses. I was thinking of a mosquito that vectors other viruses, but that's yeah. mostly because I can name those. <laughs> <laughs> the converse control that I was interested in is to infect mice with some other virus mm -hmm. that causes a similar symptom, a sim similar disease, but is not an arbovirus. Okay. And I, don't know what my candidates would be. Some that would sort be of interesting. Yes. Some yeah. sort of hemorrhag hemorrhagic fever uh, or something that is not yeah. vectored by a mosquito. So, Brianna, are you thinking of like culicine mosquitoes? That's exactly what I was thinking yeah. was a culicine mosquito. Yeah, that would be very interesting because what they do to do is well, everything so far has been done with a lab strain called the Rockefeller strain of Aedes right. aegypti. So then they try uh, to two different mosquito strains, one from Brazil, one from China. Right, and they have an albopictus too. And then they have an albopictus and they get all the same results. So multiple uh, 80s strains can uh, do the same thing. All right, so it's a volatile substance that uh, is doing this. So what is it? So they collect whole body volatiles from the mice. Uh, basically, they push air over the mice and then they go through a filter that absorbs the volatiles and then they analyze what's in there by uh, gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So they basically make some infected mouse perfume. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, you know, I'm thinking the dogs that have been trained to sniff SARS-CoV-2, they must be sniffing volatiles, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. what it is, because dog, dogs are great at sniffing volatiles, as you know. Uh, they, so they identify 422 compounds. So if you want to know what mice are given off, <laughs> 422 compounds. Um, the volatile compounds that were more than one and a half fold regulated uh, in infected versus uninfected mice were then looked at. And they find 11 volatiles upregulated, 19 downregulated in the dengue animals, and then 13 and 9 for Zika. 20 compounds, 11 up and 9 down, were common to both dengue and Zika uh, virus infected mice. So they focused on those. They this use, is, he, go ahead. I was just going to say this is where they use their electroantenogram assay, <laughs> <laughs> which 
I meant to look up and didn't. But. I did. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, so and cool. in fact, there's a wiki article on the electro antennagram. <laughs> and uh, there are various ways of doing this, but the short story is that you can actually, oh, and I looked up the methods on this too. They actually removed the antennae mm -hmm. from the mosquitoes and then you can uh, attach electrodes to it and then you can waft these um, volatiles over the antennae and you get, I mean, this... This involves electrons, so I, as it were, short out. So all I can all I can really tell you is that you get an electrical response. Okay, right. and this is an established technique. Okay, and there's various flavors on it, but basically, you take off the antennae, hook it up to an electrode, waft volatiles over it, and look for a response. Yeah, it's very cool, and because um, that's how the mosquitoes are. Sensing these volatiles yeah. via these antennae. So three compounds of their list elicited a electrophysiological response greater than 100 microvolts. So we have acetophenone, decanal, and styrene. <laughs> so immediately, what is acetophenone? So I look it up here. Listen to this. It's, it's, a, it's, a, heck, it's a ring, six-carbon ring with three double bonds. And then you have another carbon, double bond oxygen, and a methyl group. Very simple. Cetophenone is an organic compound used as an ingredient in perfumes and as a chemical intermediate in the manufacture of pharmaceuticals, resins, flavoring agents, and a form of tear gas. <laughs> and and in well fact, immediately before this, I was listening to some student presentations mm -hmm. and the chemistry students were talking about the acetophenone in their... <laughs> Wow. Um, as the in, in intermediate, yeah. How about that? Wow. It's also been used as a drug to induce sleep. So I, I would say next time you uh, have a perfume with acetophenone in it, you better think about what we're going to talk about now because it's really interesting. Well, and I wonder about the sleep part too because you could imagine someone who is sleeping would be um, someone who would be easily bitten by mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah. All right, so they tried these three. The highest response is by acetophenone. By a long shot. Yeah, it's really Ac acetophenone really stands out. So the it really tickles the antenna of the mosquitoes. They also looked at twenty other volatiles um, using a three cage olfactometer assay. So in other words, um, instead of putting mice in, they put the the compounds in and they ask where do the mosquitoes go, and they find only acetophenone attracted more mosquitoes compared to mock. And this was validated in one, in the two-port assay that I described to you as well. Then they put some acetophenone on the mouse skin to see if it can do the same thing, right? So a microgram or more of acetophenone did affect host-seeking behavior, but 0.1 microgram uh, did not. Then they got some human volunteers. <laughs> the, I guess they, you know, you can you can feed mosquitoes by putting your hand into a mosquito cage. They all they all go on your hand and they bite you and take blood. So basically, that's what they're doing here. They have volunteers where they either put acetophenone on the skin or not, and then have them put their hand in a cage and see how many mosquitoes uh, they attract. And acetophenone has a potent mosquito attracting effect on human hands. I, so, I, and I think I read this correctly. They even, you know, uh, it's this two chamber thing. So you put a acetophenone on one hand and not on the other. So you got the same human. That's right. Okay. With acetophenone on one right, hand. So that kind of controls for whatever background stink the human might have. And they're not letting them bite. They're just doing the chamber thing. Right, that's, that's what right. I was going to say. I think they go up to some screen, yeah, and then the, right. the air is wafting past them, and right, right. Attracting they, put their, mosquitoes. they put their hands in these tubes, and the air goes in, and yeah, the mosquitoes go on the screen. They don't actually bite them, but you can feed mice with with people. So you, put I think you can feed mosquitoes, not mice, with people. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I don't think mice would enjoy that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, mosquitoes. Although they, the mice do like to bite us. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so is acetophenone um, can attract mosquitoes to mice and people if you put it on their skin. 
Okay, so what um, is acetophenone involved in the? So we know if you put it on the mouse, it attracts mosquitoes, but is it involved in the virus infected mice attracting mosquitoes? Okay, so the first thing they do is measure the amount of acetophenone released from mice <laughs> by solid phase micro extraction gas chromatography mass spectrometry. You know, another form of highly sensitive chemical analysis. Um, they take the odorant blends collected on a filter, as we told you before, from either infected or uninfected mice, uh, and then they um, quantify the amount of acetophenone. The amounts of acetophenone made by virus-infected mice were 10 times higher than those made by uninfected animals for both uh, dengue and Zika virus, uh, and then uh, they assess the amount of acetophenone volatilized from the skin um, when they put 0.11 and 10 micrograms on the skin of mice. And basically, you get comparable numbers. So if you give mice one a microgram of acetophenone, it's more or less, they produce comparable airborne titers of uh, or concentrations of the, of the compound. So it looks like we're in the same area in terms of concentration. All right, so here now here's another cool <laughs> experiment. Do humans make compounds that would attract mosquitoes? So they have dengue fever patients and healthy volunteers. And they collected odorant, what they call odorant blends <laughs> from their armpits. <laughs> and I, I read this. A, this. With stir cool, bars. With stir bars, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of us use stir bars in the lab. There's Teflon coated. Uh, magnets that you drop into a solution and then you have a, a, a you put them on top of a, a contraption that has a magnet spinning and so it's been these stir bars and each all of us have them in tubes by the sink and everything and i'm look oh my gosh they have these volunteers and they're rubbing stir bars <laughs> in their no, I, and i just realized why they use a stir bar because then they can extract the odorants from the stir mm. elute the odorants from the stir bar by yeah. dropping it into this solution of hexanes on a magnetic stir so they yeah. stir it around. No, yeah. it makes yep. perfect Very sense. Very cool. Yep. I mean, these are also, specially coded stir bars, yeah. right? right? Yeah. Right. Right. And so, and I'm thinking that they're the ones that are, you know, three inches. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Probably. Big old yeah. stir bars. Yeah. <laughs> they come in all sizes. We used to Centimeter the diameter. Yeah. The little tiny ones. The fleas. Have you ever fleas. used the fleas? The fleas. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes the uh, fleas. Listen, dudes, <laughs> I've made my own fleas. Really? Oh. Yeah. You, uh, this is aside, aside. <laughs> you take a pastor, a long nose pastor pipette, mm -hmm. seal off one end, and then clip off a bit of paper clip ah, and drop yes. it in, and then cut the pastor pipette and on the other it. side and seal that off. Oh, yeah. Oh, Perfect. Yeah. You got a flea, dude. Mm, yeah. That's you, don't, you don't have to buy it. Cool. cool. That's very good. And it's yeah. clear. Yep. I like yep. that. Yep. So the other thing is that uh, these people that they're going to collect these volatiles from avoided spicy food, garlic, and alcohol, <laughs> and used non-perfumed soap. Mm -hmm. so they kind of are thinking of everything here. Yeah. Good. That's really good because all those things could affect it. Yeah. It, uh, well, I can I can imagine the experimental failures where something yeah. didn't work and they go, wait a minute, what did you have for lunch? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think that, so this is something I'll mention later on, um, but I actually do think it's also important that they were looking at the armpit um, mm -hmm. and not places where they might have had other kinds of products. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty sheltered area, right? Um, and it does exude volatiles, as we know. So... <laughs> um, they, they take these star bars, they put them in hexane, and then that extracts uh, the, the, um, the compounds. And then they have a negative control uh, from the same volunteer um, with a solvent blank. So there's, there's no solvent to extract what's on it. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. They extract the volatiles and then they put them on the palm of a volunteer for this mosquito behavioral <laughs> assay that we just mentioned, right? So they extract volatiles from one person's armpit and they put it on the palm of another person 
who then puts their hand in this contraption and they measure the mosquitoes coming to it. And the negative control, that's what the same other hand of the same volunteer right. uh, with a, a solvent only blank. So you can right. put both hands in. As Kathy said, it's a great setup because you can put both hands in at once. And so the hands with volatiles from dengue pa patients had higher attractivity uh, for mosquitoes than from healthy donors. So dengue infection elicits some kind of emission that's a cue for mosquito. Um, then they go into a little bit of a rat hole, in my opinion. <laughs> so the hexane uh, are, extracts uh, nonpolar compounds, right? Because mm. hexane is nonpolar. So they say, what about the polar compounds? Maybe they could be attractants as well. So they do... Uh, they use they use hexane and then they use methanol to to get the polar compounds out, um, and they find that the methanol extract can attract mosquitoes as well. Um, but from dengue patients, uh, there's no difference in the polar compounds compared to healthy donors. So there's something in everybody that's attracting some polar compounds in everyone that's attracting mosquitoes, but they're not upregulated by uh, virus infection. Um, so then they analyze human skin by a different kind of mass spec, <laughs> thermal desorption gas chromatography mass spec. Uh, and the dengue patients had higher emission of acetophenone than healthy donors. And I also found this is, I found this very cool. Uh, so, so dengue infected people are making acetophenone. Okay. They also make six other volatiles. So if you're wondering what your skin is giving off, besides acetophenone, 2,4-dimethyl-1-heptine, decanal, ethylbenzene, methyl palmitate, styrene, and toluene. Toluene. Wow. <laughs> They're also found on the human skin. Um, but no differences in um, the, the amount of these other compounds between dengue and healthy donors. So they're focusing on acetophenone. Uh, for the rest of this paper. I just thought it was fascinating what's what, what the volatiles are that you're giving off. Especially toluene. Well, and these guys are leaving no stone unturned. Yes, it may be a rat hole, but they, they, they're very yeah, thorough. Yeah. I really mm -hmm. appreciate that. But, you know, toluene we use in the lab occasionally. You don't want to get it yeah, on you. It's bad stuff. Right? It's bad stuff. And here we have it a little bit. We have you it. know, all the bad stuff is stuff that I really loved the smell of. I can still <laughs> smell toluene. Does that mean you're a mosquito? Yeah, uh, yeah it could be. It could be I'm a mosquito. But, but you probably do. Actually, does anybody even use scintillation fluid anymore? There used to be uh, toluene-based so. uh, scintillation fluid. That doesn't exist anymore, does it? No, we just threw out boxes of scintillation yeah, fluid. Yeah, because the toxicity of uh, toluene. Man, ether... Toluene, chloroform, benzene. I love all those. You things. love those? I, I like, even like mercaptoethanol. I like mercaptoethanol. That's how I am. Fresh, uh, fresh yeah, mercaptoethanol. Because of the, yeah. you know, it's there's all these associations. You know? yeah. How about DMSO? Uh, it's an you know, interesting I'm not as familiar one. with that. It's okay. Are you, are you a taster? See, uh, I'm a taster. Uh, yeah. I am yeah. a taster, yeah. So I worked at a lab before I went to grad school. We had 55 gallon drums of DMSO to dissolve things in. And I would pipette it or get a little bit on my skin. And I would taste it, yeah, immediately. Yeah. 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 So for people who, it's not that we're purposefully actually imbibing it and tasting it. It's that getting it on your skin or mucous membranes makes you have this taste yeah. in your mouth. That's. Ugh. I used to mouth pipette all this stuff. <laughs> That's how Anything. old I am. So, so yeah. basically, people may know this. If you dissolve something in DMSO and you rub it on your skin, it's very efficiently taken up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so many people put drugs in DMSO and take them. I did, I did not do that. I'm just relaying that information. Because <laughs> <laughs> actually, the reason I'm telling you this is the company I worked for had a drug which they were testing. They thought uh, reduced prostate size, right? So as men get older, their prostates get bigger, and this drug was supposed to shrink them. And we always joked that, you know, we were dissolving this drug in the DMSO, and then we get it on our, a little bit on our skin, so we're all going to have normal prostates for many years. <laughs> but 
that's why you have to be careful. All right, so where does acetophenone come from? Here, this is extremely cool. It is a common metabolic byproduct from bacteria. And it can be made from ethyl benzene by an enzyme called ethyl benzene dehydrogenase and then further converted. But the enzymes needed to make acetophenone aren't in mammalian genomes. We can't make them. So uh, they speculate must be the microbes, either in our intestines or on our skin. So what do you think they did? If you suspect microbes, yeah, you get some antibiotics. <laughs> And then you see what happens. So they uh, treat mice with uh, oral antibiotic cocktail to get to re reduce uh, gastrointestinal microbes, uh, and then they um, they checked in this three chamber test if if uh, mosquitoes prefer virus infected mice, <coughs> and depletion of the gut microbiota doesn't affect influence of. Um, of, back, of a mosquito for the mice. Uh, but if you get rid of uh, microbes on the skin. Which, which they, they do by sonication <laughs> brushing and 70% yeah. ethanol spraying. Poor mice, sonication brushing. The 70% ethanol, wow. Well, if you do that, then uh, the, the mosquitoes are less attracted to infected mice. It's more like uninfected controls. So apparently the skin microbiome is important. Yeah, and this reminded me of our recent immune episode um, where we were talking about skin microbiome and wound healing. Um, mm. And so now I want to know what happens if we use sonication brushing um, in those assays as well. Yeah, it's, it's going to slow down wound healing, right? Yeah. So it's the skin microbiota that's the source of uh, acetophenone. So, of course, they want to know <laughs> what, what microbes are doing this. Uh, and so they they find, first of all, if you look at cultivatable or cultivable, they say it, over on TWIM we say cultivatable, skin bacteria are enhanced tenfold after dengue or Zika infection. So the number of cultivatable skin bacteria goes up 10 times. And uh, certain genera are particularly upregulated, like Bacillus, Brevundimonas, and Staphylococcus go up. And 16 other genera, members of 16 other genera, like lactobacilli and pantoia, go down on the skin of infected mice. So some bacteria go up and some go down. Um, and so they isolate individual bacteria from, from mouse skin. And they ask, can, which bacteria can make acetophenone, Right. And the most potent producers are four bacillus species. Um, lactobacilli can't make it. Those are the ones that are downregulated by infection, by virus infection. So the upregulated bacteria can make acetophenone. The downregulated ones cannot. So that's the idea here, that somehow the virus is upregulating the bacteria on the skin that make acetophenone, downregulating the ones that cannot, the net effect is you make more acetophenone and that in turn is attracting mosquitoes. Now, I just want to say that this is the product of evolution, right? Mm -hmm. It is not that the virus intentionally does this. <laughs> it's just the way it's evolved over the millennia. Um, and so then they use their three-cage assay to uh, ask if we treat mice with bacillus, can we attract mosquitoes or any bacteria? So they use the different bacilli, Flexus, Megaterium, Proteolyticus, Weedmani. If you put those on the mouse skin, those mice are more attractive mosquitoes. If you put lactobacillus on, various lactobacilli, they don't attract mice. So, oh gosh, so many cool experiments all tying it in together, right? Mm -hmm. Virus infection upregulates uh, bacteria that make acetophenone, downregulate bacteria that do not. Uh, I want to interject something here because I've been looking for ultrasonic brushes because <laughs> I wanted to know what this was. And by God, uh, it's like an ultrasonic toothbrush. Mm. Some of the electric toothbrushes are actually, I didn't know this, 
are actually ultrasonic toothbrushes. Hmm. Okay, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's what this was. Uh, operates by generating ultrasound in order to aid in removing plaque and rendering plaque bacteria harmless. So uh, if I want to avoid being bitten by mosquitoes, I should rub an ultrasonic toothbrush on my arm? Well, your whole uh, body. You're going to have to do your whole body. <laughs> yeah, I sure. Think, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything exposed, face, neck, arms, right? Legs, maybe. Yeah. Or you, there's a drug we could give you. Uh, actually, well, I'm yeah. going to that. Yes. I'm gonna get, <laughs> right. I'm gonna get to that. When we get to the end of this, we have a solution. <laughs> All right. So, so um, <clears throat> they want to know what the virus infection is doing to uh, affect the, the levels of bacteria. And, and, you know, our skin has a lot of antimicrobial proteins that are produced by the microbiome that are very important in the homeostasis of the skin. So they do whole... RNA seq of the skin to uh, compare um, to see what's going on in terms of uh, these antimicrobial peptides. 317 genes up or down regulated in dengue and Zika virus infected animals, and the most significantly downrated down regulated gene is one called RET NLA. RET NLA, which encodes resistant like molecule alpha, which is an antimicrobial protein produced by epidermal keratinocytes and sebocytes. And this uh, protein shapes the composition of bacterial communities on the skin. And it's important for preventing uh, pathogenic infection, bacterial infection of the skin. So this, these transcripts from this gene, this RET, RET NLA gene, are down-regulated uh, in virus-infected mice. They also look at the protein, and they show that that's down-regulated as well. Uh, the human genome encodes two of these uh, proteins, RELM proteins, uh, and uh, one of them is mostly expressed by keratinocytes and sebaceous glands of the skin, and then there's another uh, produced in the intestine. So they make these proteins, these two proteins, uh, and they make them in E. coli. They purify them, and they um, add the proteins to... Uh, ba various bacteria that you would find on the skin, and both reduce the viability of various bacilli in a dose-dependent manner. So in other words, these RETN proteins are antimicrobial for these bacilli that are producing the um, acetyl, acetyl, what was the name of the damn thing? Acetyl what? I forgot the name of the thing. Acetophenone? Acetophenone. Yes, acetophenone. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, recombinant. They uh, the growth the, the growth is inhibited. Um, all right, so on the skin of the mouse, they put bacteria on the skin, uh, and then uh, they have um, mice that are deficient in uh, one of these RELM proteins, and in those in that in those mice, the bacillus species become dominant. So the idea here is that the flaviviruses virus is downregulate RELMs, these proteins. It favors the proliferation of bacilli that produce acetophenone. So that's the mechanism. Well, actually, the mechanism, not quite clear, but um, that's, that's how it works. Now, um, you can induce the production of these RELMs by dietary vitamin A, and this will shape the communities of the skin microbiome. So they said, would oral administration of vitamin A derivatives rescue uh, production of RELM in flavy virus infected animals? Remember, the flavy infection is somehow downregulating these RELMs, these antimicrobial proteins. So can we reverse it with vitamin A? And, and so, if yeah. people, some people may have already had alarm bells ringing in their head here. Um, I certainly did, because there are some other names <laughs> that you yeah. may know of uh, some of these vitamin A derivatives as. Um, one of them is you may know about retinoic acid. This is basically yep. retinoic acid. Yep. Um, yep. But uh, many people, uh, myself included at points in my life, have taken um, these vitamin A derivatives as acne medicines. Right. Um, if anyone has taken retin-A, this is retin-A. Um, which is the name of that acne medicine. And so um, 
the idea of putting vitamin A derivatives on your skin um, is not new. Not new. Yeah. And in fact, many people do or have done it. And so what they do is these derivatives induce the antimicrobial peptide and it reduces the bacterial, certain bacteria on your skin, right? Mm -hmm. And the one in particular that they're talking about here is isotretinoin, which is also known as Roaccutane. Yeah, yep. it, it, it's, it's retin-A. <laughs> Right, and, yeah. um, but you're saying put it on your skin, but it's also taken orally. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yes, the the things I am most uh, I know about the most are putting it on your skin, but there are people who take it orally as well. Yeah, because this one it says is to treat severe cystic acne that is not responded to other treatment. Yeah, also used to treat some skin cancers and some ichthyoses, a harlequin type and a lamellar type. All from Wikipedia. Rich would be proud. <laughs> yes. No, I have definitely put this on my face. So they give, they feed mice, they orally feed them uh, this isotretinoin. Uh, and then they ask, how do, after you infect them, how do um, uh, mosquitoes find them? Uh, and so, First of all, giving the mice this derivative, vitamin A derivative, depression, de decreases the production of uh, RELM mRNAs. The bacilli are reduced on the skin of the treated animals. Uh, and then when they look at mosquito preference, um, this is very interesting now. There are far more mosquitoes feeding on flavia infected mice than in uninfected mice. And it didn't matter whether you treated them with isoretinoin or not. It had the same number of mosquitoes on virus infected and uninfected. But if then they take those mosquitoes that have fed on the mice, allow them to live and then quantify the amount of virus in them, they find that giving the mice isotretinoin reduces the number of virus positive mosquitoes. So, this is reducing viral transmission in some way. Yeah, I was a little sad about some of this because I was really hoping that they were going to tell me that um, putting the drug on stopped mosquitoes from biting or changed. I don't know why it didn't. I know. I and, know and, why, right? and then I was going to, then I was ready to despair about having put this on my face, which does not get a lot of mosquito bites. Yeah. Um, and wondering, have, have I had the cure to not having mosquito bites in my uh, house all along. So I don't understand because the, the retino, the vitamin A derivative is supposed to um, decrease the, the number of bacilli, which are making the compound, right? right? Yet the, the mosquitoes don't seem to have a preference in this one experiment anyway uh, on infected mice. There are far more mosquitoes on... Uh, so far more mosquitoes successfully feeding on flavia infected than uninfected. Of note, the mosquitoes feeding on isotretinoin-treated virus-infected mice were the same as those feeding on uninfected animals. So the number, I, I presume, were this, was the same. Yet what's different is there's less transmission. I don't know why that would be. Uh, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it could be a difference in whether this is oral administration versus whether this is putting it on the skin. Maybe that the mosquitoes land and they don't bite. Right? Maybe, yeah. Maybe they're not attracted. Maybe they had a whiff and they went to the mouse. And the, Nah, I don't really. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yes. I don't know what that is. Yes, because um, you could imagine that you could look at mosquitoes, say, preference of where they were biting on people with and without different acne yeah. medications. Yeah. But also, do they bite the people's, I mean, I guess no one, mosquitoes don't really bite people's face. But do, you're that would be a control sure, of different sure. body parts and do they have the medication or not. But you could imagine that there are going to be trials now oh, of, yeah. of this for mosquito biting, right? I don't think there's an there, – is there any negative to putting these compounds on your skin? Oh, yeah. Um, Retin-A uh, can cause um, some pretty severe birth defects mm. um, and it also um, – has a role in DNA damage. You have to use a lot of sunscreen when you're using these products. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you're pregnant, you can't use this, mm -hmm. right? And if you're in the sun, you shouldn't yeah. use it either, which is probably if you're going to be bitten by a mosquito, you're in a place with a lot of yes, sun, right? probably. <laughs> yeah. So that's the story. Um, these virus infection induces the production of 
suppresses the production of these antimicrobials by altering the skin microbiota, and that produces more volatiles that attract the mosquitoes. So the one of the remaining things they address is or talk about in the discussion is how does the virus infection suppress uh, infect, uh, production of these antimicrobial peptides? And I thought I would let Brienne talk about this because this ties in with innate immunity, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we can imagine that virus infection is going to change um, what kind of innate immune responses are being made and thus which antimicrobial peptides are being transcribed. Yeah, so it's the, the signaling through toll-like receptors and even rig eye like receptors have mm -hmm. intersections with... Uh, so. Rig, rig I is retinoic acid inducible exactly. receptor, right? So <laughs> there could be some tie there. So they say so flavivirus infection might modulate these antimicrobial peptides by interfering with toll like receptor or rig R uh, like receptor related signaling in keratinocytes and sebocytes. Very cool. A thorough understanding and interruption of vector host interactions may offer insight to develop an effective strategy for controlling arboviral diseases. I think this is fabulous. Really, I think it's, it's a just, cool paper. Uh, mm -hmm. really Very cool. Ex extensive experiments, multiple attacks on one problem. Very convincing in the end, I think. Um, and now we can say virus infections can, in fact, m modify the host to uh, attract vectors. But the cool thing is, it's, uh, this is something that happened accidentally over evolution, right? Yeah, but and I was it, I was going to say, zooming zooming way out, uh, I think it's fair to fair to conclude that this evolved. Yes, it happened accidentally, but it has a selective advantage from the virus's perspective. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you can imagine there were viruses transmitted by mosquitoes, <clears> and then <throat> you know, as we know, RNA viruses. Uh, undergoing rapid mutation, and some arose randomly that could somehow uh, downregulate these antimicrobial peptides for whatever random reason, and those were favored. They're they're more fit because they attract mosquitoes. Because they transmit more. Yeah, they transmit more because it's a tough problem for the mosquito to find the virus infected host, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, it's, and this really helps them. Fascinating. So, this is one set of viruses and, and, you know, 80s mosquitoes. What about all the other? Do they do similar things? Are there different compounds involved? Or is it all the same? That'd be really interesting to sort out, right? So good for you, uh, scientists who did this. Yeah, great really stuff. Nice job. Really nice. And something different, a little bit different. But I think the, the broader picture is that you should think that virus infection may modulate many things, not just your skin volatiles, but could be modulating all sorts of things, right? And it may not be super direct. Yes. That's right. To, to somehow improve, say, finding another host transmission in some way. It doesn't have to be a mosquito. It could be a, an infection that's transmitted in other ways. So it just needs to be sorted out. Okay. Let's do some emails. Okay, Rich, you should take that first one. John writes, Dr. Twiv, still a fairly comfortable 85 Fahrenheit, 29 Celsius in greater Braddock. The promised rain has apparently been delayed for an hour. My plants are unimpressed with, with this. Indeed, Rich, what is chemical biology, if not biochemistry? This was <laughs> a discussion we had a while ago. Somebody was talking about chemical biology, and I'm going, like, what? <laughs> is that like biochemistry? Somewhere along the line, biochemistry seemed to have become a dirty word in our own lifetime. I joined the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in early 1985. <laughs> that only lasted a few months before biochemistry and microbiology were combined, forming a Department of Microbiology and Biochemistry, to some chagrin, mainly because I think biochemistry and microbiology rolls <laughs> off the tongue better, with Julie Youngner as chair. Then, a few years later, my nemesis, Joe Glorioso, arrived from Ann Arbor, and the department was renamed Molecular Genetics and Biochemistry. 
at least biochemistry stayed in the title, but molecular biology was the actual reigning term. Mm -hmm. Five years or so later, I moved down the hill, but not downhill, to biological sciences in the home of Roger Hendricks, a much better fit. Somewhere along the line, I began calling myself a protein chemist as a, as a pushback. I told someone that once, and they replied that they didn't know uh, that there were any of those left. <laughs> For a decade or so, I was on the editorial review board of the European Journal of Biochemistry. What I really liked about that was that it was a successor to uh, Biochemises Zeitschrift. That seemed just so cool. Plus, Per Edom's paper on the spinning cup sequinator was the first paper in the issue. But then they changed their name. Uh, then they changed the title to a f uh, to Feb's Journal, another damn acronym. I didn't actually resign, but I asked them to take my name off the list of editors in protest. Anyway, I've always felt comfortable around chemists, one of whom told me that I wasn't bad for a biologist. <laughs> a decade ago, I was headed out the door uh, for good at Pitt. One of them also told me that the chemistry department was trying to become as biologically relevant as fast as possible. So that's probably the driving force <laughs> behind chemical biology. Cheers, John. What's in a name, right? That's yes. right. We, we yeah, do offer uh, both a chemical biology class um, or, a, or biochemistry too that are alternatives mm. for the students. And biochemistry too is really hardcore chemistry to biochemistry and chemical yeah. biology is the biological applications. Hmm. I see. Yeah. I biochemistry can be different things to different people. As I recall, there were, uh, I think two biochemistry courses, uh, at least at the uh, university of Florida, one of which was taught by, uh, the biochemistry department of the medical school. And another was taught by something on the order of a chemical biology department in, uh, in the, uh, in chemistry in the undergraduate school. And they were quite different courses, I think. The department names are, are interesting. Mm. You know, they change a lot. So our oh, yeah. department I, I'm in started as bacteriology in the 50s. Then it became microbiology and more recently microbiology and immunology, right? And so I'm not sure what the motivation is. Sometimes it's for students to make them think that we have all this stuff here, but really how much do they look at the name of a department? I really don't know. Well, I'll tell you, I, I have experience with this. When I first joined uh, the department at uh, UF, uh, it was uh, immunology and medical microbiology, pronounced I-M-M-M, -M -M, which was mm -hmm. a little uh, cutesy thing that Parker Small came up with. But over time, in particular, when Dick Moyer took over the chairmanship after Parker, um, uh, most of the immunologists fled to the pathology department and elsewhere. And the department became more and more sort of, uh, actually, it always, from Ken Burns' time, had, had a, a lot of uh, virology flavor that was retained uh, and a lot of molecular biology. And I became... Uh, the, I forget what they called it, but I was it's basically director director of the graduate program. And I get calls all the time from people looking for an immunology program because we were called immunology and medical microbiology. And after mm -hmm. a couple of years of this, I said, forget it, man. Uh, we gotta, uh, I, I don't want to take these calls anymore. Let's change our name. <laughs> uh, so that it reflects who's actually in the department. So departments evolve. Okay? Yeah, they do. Uh, nowadays, there are some very creative names for departments. Forget about microbiology, immunology, molecular. There's just, I can't think of any now, but they're just, you know, uh, chemical pathogenesis, for example, yeah. stuff like that. What's your department, Kathy? Micro and immunology? Yeah. And yeah. Brianne, what's yours? Biology. I like biology. That, <laughs> when, I, when I hear biology, I think, oh, I'm going to hear all kinds of things. Yeah. That's and exactly fact, what happens. It's nice. It's very cool. Even virology, right? Absolutely. Probably got plants in there, right? We got some plants. Uh, today, I also heard a presentation about um, squirrel populations. Oh, cool. Nice. Very cool. Kathy, can you take the next one? Anne writes, I listen to many twivs happily and suck 
up the information. I'm a neurologist and am involved in a lot of neurology, psychiatry, overlap issues, and read, read or read hungrily emerging information regarding long COVID, central and peripheral nervous system syndromes. Regarding episode 913 and the comments regarding the Minnesota governor, parentheses, physician candidate, with maliciously mistaken beliefs about COVID vaccines, ivermectin, etc. I read Medscape frequently, an article summary condensation and opinion-free publication for any medically affiliated person, also open to anyone in the public with respect to COVID issues. There are many reader comments by physicians, nurses, psychologists, medical administrators, maybe chiropractors, that are conspicuously uninformed with very forceful opinions about COVID vaccination, COVID epidemiology, strong intermixing of, quote, politics and tribalism with a science, with science mm. slash lack of. This is a very well-read publication by physicians, and it may surprise you how prevalent these cult-like anti-opinions are. <laughs> There are also a number of not-so-underground physician podcasts with these types of themes. And I believe there may be general reticence on the part of medical boards to pursue these behaviors. I think that the one-third or more of the general population in this poorly steered ship is in the, quote, medically educated population as well, for hmm. your information. Thanks, Anne. Yeah. So I've, uh, I, I'm... Uh, happy to hear uh, an opinion from a genuine MD about Medscape because mm -hmm. I run across this now and then and I've wondered about its legitimacy. And it sounds like, uh, if I read this correctly, it sounds like, yes, legitimate, but um, read it with uh, caution, in particular relative to the comments and stuff, yeah. right? Yep, yep. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Uh, Brianne, I'm going to take the next one. Is that okay? That is fine. Guy writes, hi, Twivers. I'm curious. Polio is supposedly eradicated in the U.S., but what does that mean exactly? We have people coming in from Afghanistan and Pakistan, and the vaccinated ones are getting OPV. According to the CDC pink book on polio, we have seen some vaccine-caused polio floating around for some time before being detected at times. Is this enough to find in wastewater? Are we really checking wastewater everywhere? Are they checking it more in the UK? I suspect we never see polio disease here because most everybody is vaccinated. But how much asymptomatic polio infection is there? Is this another case of not finding it because we don't look? If there really was no polio in the US, why do we keep vaccinating kids for it? Thanks for all the great info. In capital letters, <laughs> Guy. <laughs> Guy, you got it. Right on the nose, <laughs> except the last statement, if there's really no polio, why do we keep vaccinating kids? Because, as you say, it could come in from Afghanistan and Pakistan, where wild type 1 polio is still circulating. Or, if you stop vaccinating, the vaccine-derived polio can cause outbreaks. So that's what happens in many countries in Africa. They stop vaccinating, and the vaccine-derived viruses cause polio. So you have to keep vaccinating until there's no more wild polio and until either we switch entirely to an activated vaccine and the oral viruses go away or this new, new OPV2 that we've been using, which is supposedly less able to revert. If we use that universally, and that gets rid of the circulating OPV. Now, the sewage. In the U.S., we do not check sewage for polio. I've said this a dozen times. I'll say it again. Years ago, we asked Mark Palanche, who was the head of Entros at CDC, why don't we check? He said, because when we find it, we won't know what to tell people. <laughs> right? We're all vaccinated. We still have polio in our sewers. So we don't check. In the U.K., they do. And then they will periodically find uh, vaccine-derived strains as they have recently. So I'm sure these vaccine-derived viruses are everywhere. And in places where vaccine coverage gets low, they can uh, go from person to person, I bet, if they're enough susceptible people. And so how much polio do we have? Is there any um, 
asymptomatic polio in the U.S.? I don't think so. I think the vaccine the vaccine coverage is really good uh, in the U.S. But remember, we're using IPV, inactivated polio vaccine. So the virus can still get into your intestine and re- reproduce and be shed. So that could be an asymptomatic polio infection, if you will. And I have no idea how many of those there are in the U.S. But, um, you know, in the U.K., in this part of town where vaccination coverage dropped, we we think we see uh, reproduction of these vaccine-derived strains in people. So I bet it's happening here. So uh, to think about this another way, I was thinking about it from if we use the figure that, you know, one in 200 polio virus infections results in a, a paralytic case, mm-hmm. then you'd have to have 200 asymptomatic cases in order to see right um, to see polio disease. But lately when there have been paralysis cases, they've been checked presumably extensively for whether they're polio and, and they're presumed to be due to some of these other enteroviruses, mm-hmm. right? Some of them, in some cases, yeah. Some of them. Yeah, so acute flaccid, now the name, acute flaccid myelitis, that's what we call this paralysis now. And m- another, multiple enteroviruses can cause it besides 68 and 71 and others. And so, yes, they could be responsible. But you're right, if polio were involved, you'd need to have many, to get a case of paralysis, you would most likely have many hundreds of uh, asymptomatic infections. And so that only happens in countries where <laughs> vaccination coverage really drops, right? And then you find extent, then you find a case or two of paralysis, and that must mean that many people are infected. Yeah. I, have oh, just a, I have just a nugget of pedantry here that I'd like to clear up for my own sake, if nothing else. He starts off by saying, I'm curious, Supposedly, uh, polio is supposedly, in quotes, eradicated in the U.S. And I want to define eradication, uh, in particular, as opposed to elimination. Because mm. my understanding, correct me if I'm probably wrong, is that eradication really is talking about globally, gone, like smallpox, like renderpest, okay? Whereas elimination is that it has been um removed or uh, suppressed to nothing in a particular geographic area. So I would say that polio has been eliminated from the US but not yet eradicated globally. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's fair and I mean we certainly have no more paralytic polio in the US, right? right. We have virus circulating. Um so I think eliminated is appropriate. Yeah. I mean, we we have eradicated smallpox, right? Yeah, it's gone, as far as we can tell. But it's not the case with polio. I mean, I, was, I don't know, I forgot who I was having a conversation with recently about this. Basically, we have replaced in most places the wild type polio with the vaccine strains. <laughs> We've replaced them, and the vaccine strains continue to circulate, and they can cause polio. So uh, sometime, Vincent, uh, you uh, mentioned this uh, uh, new OPV. Oh, yes, yes. Can we discuss that sometime? Because I yes. remember doing papers about candidate uh, modified OPVs, okay? But I've not followed this. So I didn't know that w- one of them has made it into a vaccine. Is that right? Is that what you're telling yeah, me? Yeah, so in fact, there was a MMWR that someone sent us a week or two ago, I think. And you said, let's do this because it, it tracks... Um, how many people have gotten the new OPV2 and they've done some sequencing and they don't see reversion. So we'll do that. Yeah, that'd be um, good. And in particular for our new listeners who haven't heard this whole story before, this will be good. Yeah. Uh, and I Googled elimination versus eradication. <laughs> um, and your definition, Rich, was pretty much perfect. Okay, good. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Brenda writes, hi, honored Twivers. The topic of correlation came up in TWIV 911. I'd like to draw your attention to Tim Harford. He is well known in the UK, including his role as the presenter of the BBC Radio 4 broadcast segment, More or Less. Correlation is not causation, could be said to be something of a watchword of the program. I'm pretty sure 
certain the ice cream drowning case has been mentioned. <laughs> See also this. And she gives a link. Um, and I like the title, A Nobel P Memorial Prize for Turning Statistics into Insight. On the subject of looking in the wrong place for the cause, I would like to draw your attention to this. And she gives a link to a director's blog from the NIH um, about uh, different sugars and C. diff. Um, I think y'all are on the right track by questioning the heavy focus on viruses and adenovirus in particular. The search should surely be expanded to include bacteria and possibly food additives. Um, and this is in the recent hepatitis cases in children that she references. Um, yours, Brenda, who is from Black Isle, Scotland. Hmm. Interesting article. Has an alternative to table sugar contributed to the C. diff epidemic? Jeez. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Interesting. This is by uh, Francis Collins. Francis Collins, yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Brenda. Um, let's do a couple more. Um, we're back to who did the first one? Was that Kathy? No, Rich. It was Rich. It was Rich. Rich. Yeah. Rich. Uh, okay, so where am I? So we're at Dale. Dale writes Hello, Twift team. I was listening to the discussion in Epitope 917 about the meaning of acute. And I thought I might be able to throw my two cents in. For reference, I'm a pharmacist, so we deal with acute and chronic conditions all the time. Great. In medicine, acute doesn't always describe severity, but always describes duration. Ah, good. Acute conditions only for a... Acute conditions only for a relatively short period of time, while chronic is a long-term thing. So, with regards to SARS-CoV-2 and the letter saying it's not always acute, the way I see it is this. The infection is acute because it usually lasts only 10 to 14 days on average. However, the disease can potentially be described as chronic in some patients in the form of long COVID. I hope that helps. Dale is a PharmD in Salt Lake City. Yes, that's great. And I'm glad to have that, once again, independently confirmed by somebody in the health professions and in a different branch of health uh, professions. That's great. So that's <clears throat> maybe what Jens was talking about when he said it's not always acute. I was puzzled, but maybe he's referring to long the COVID. disease. The, the yeah, disease, yeah. Yeah, that's probably it. Okay. Right, let's stop there because the next one is rather long. I just wanted to get the acute one in. Uh, and let's go on to some picks of the week. Some good ones coming up. Brianne, what do you have for us today? Um, so in a past uh, pick, someone got me hooked on the game Wordle. Um, <laughs> that <laughs> uh, has has you know, gone around to many others. And more recently, I have been hooked on a, another game called Redactyl. Um, the first time I saw it and it, the first time it was described to me, it was a bit overwhelming. Um, but I have since become hooked very hard. <laughs> um, and so um, with Redactyl, uh, you are looking at a redacted version of one of the top 10,000 Wikipedia pages. And you need to guess words to try to determine what Wikipedia page it is. Um, and so you can start guessing sort of common words and maybe narrowing down to if it was a science or a food or politics or something like that. And then you sort of narrow further and further in. Um, I've been doing it for maybe a month now. Um, I would say probably half of them have been somewhat science related. Um, yesterday's was bamboo. And I learned a lot about bamboo um, and the <laughs> uses of bamboo. Um, and... I find it really fun and really addictive. This is cool. Brianne, I typed, here's what I did. I typed uh -huh. any, north, and virus, no yep. hits. Then I typed science and I got a hit. Okay. And then it shows you where the hit is in exactly, the thing. Exactly, exactly. And then you can, you can start to refine, right? Yes. So then you start to get an idea of what sort of genre um, and you can refine. I'm getting one of these privacy error yeah, messages. I got that. Oh, you, really? Did you just yeah. go ahead? I just went ahead, yeah. yeah it's, I it, had gotten one of those before, but it, it's gone away since uh, for me. Their, their certificate is probably expired. It's, it's probably okay. Uh, cool. What is I, I really word? enjoy it. There's a new one every day at noon, um, and so it's what I do while I eat my lunch now. I'm not doing very well. 
Actually, so you have to focus basically when you click on the word you guess, then they show you where it is in the mm-hmm. sentence. Yes. And if you go to the bottom right by where you type in the new words, there's a thing that says top and that will take you back to the top of the article. Huh. So the thing I got was, so science, the only word I got so far, and a blank blank of science was blank, period. My next guess would be branch. Branch? Because it might be a branch of science. Let's see. Nope. Oh. <laughs> and a new. How about new? <laughs> new, N-E-W. yeah. N-E-W, that would go in there. Yeah, there we go, four hits. And I knew something <laughs> of science was Born? Could that be born? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Vincent is now hooked. Oh, I get this is fun. I actually don't do Wordle at all, but this is cool. I really like but, this. But you know, I'm going to end up wasting hours on this. I can tell. But at least you hone your, your word usage, you, you, right? You hone your word usage. And sometimes I'll, I've learned, you know, oh, it, it might be a branch of chemistry and I will have to go on Wikipedia and start learning about some branches of chemistry to give me some ideas. Uh, so you do learn something. So the cheaters thing is if you get a sentence, then you just Google it and you can find the whole article. Yeah. Probably, right. But you don't yeah. cheat, right? I have only done that once because it was very hard. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> wow. How many guesses does it ordinarily take you? Um, I have had I had one notable one that I did in seven guesses. Holy um, cow! And I also have some that have taken me a couple hundred. <laughs> but seven guesses for the, for all of them? How do you do that? That the the one that had seven guesses was night. Oh. And I I figured out night pretty quickly. Wow, cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked a video that somehow <laughs> I got. Uh, it's on Instagram, and I'm not. I don't have the Instagram app, so I was able to see it without logging in. And then the next time I went to it to try and pick it for today, um, I couldn't see it. And then I tried again this morning and I could. So I don't understand why I can sometimes see Instagram things with or without it. Anyway, it's a long story to explain that what it is is Kirigami paper. And that's sort of related to origami, but the way they show it here is... um, it's paper and then it's cut and scored, but not necessarily all the way through. And then you can pull it apart and it can, it's a way to replace bubble wrap. And it was part of something for International uh, Women in Engineering Day. And I think this was um, by Physics Girl and Physics Girl does have a presence on other social media in addition to Instagram. So anyway, they show how you could wrap something up in this kirigami paper and uh, it may be a way to save us from bubble wrap. Hmm. I think this is very cool. I'm interested in anything that gets us out of this addiction to plastic. Yeah. Plastic is just so, I mean, bottled water makes me so angry. Yeah. Okay. And bubble wrap is a, is a close second. <laughs> This, this is, great. is really cool, Kathy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's it's really ingenious how you have this roll of stuff that mm-hmm. really just pops into um, uh, a three dimensional thing. Very cool. Yeah, the plastic is horrible. So much of it, and but you know, some companies are doing paper, but not enough. Ah. And Amazon doesn't do enough. You get all those those pillows with air in it, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. Rich, what do you have for us? Okay, so this is almost too obvious, but we've spent <laughs> so much time on the James Webb Space Telescope that I think uh, the first images coming from the telescope, which are dropping today, uh, really need to be picked. Uh, so uh, they there was a teaser image that came out a couple of days ago uh, that I want to discuss in a little more detail. And then they've been... Uh, dropping these throughout the day, and I link to the site where they're dropping them. And there's now one, two, three, four, five different images that you can click on, and you can zero in the, on those, and they give you uh, some uh, more detail. And these these are just stunning. It's just amazing. And and you got to keep in mind that without this telescope, you can't see this stuff. <clears throat> I want to personalize this a little bit by 
uh, saying that I was, I went rowing this morning. So I went down and Kathy can picture this, right? Because mm-hmm. you can pe- picture the, the rowing dock. And one of the uh, coaches there is a guy who I believe has a PhD in astronomy. Uh, but then as, and uh, he was on his, on a path to be a professional astronomer in some capacity or another. And as he described to me, and I didn't press him on this, he said, life got in the way. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't know what he uh, actually winds up doing for a living, but I encounter him as a, uh, uh, a rowing coach. And I saw him down this morning and uh, he's always looking at the sky and telling me what's going on. And uh, we got into a discussion about, the James Webb telescope. And look at this, if you're clicking on this, look at the original image that was dropped. It's called SMACS 0723. And Mm -hmm. I commented to him that I was blown away by the fact that this galactic cluster is 4.6 billion years away. Mm -hmm. He says, no, 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 no. It's much cooler than that. First of all, look at the little arc-shaped, smeary things, okay? Those are, I got to go back to my pick, those are either fragmentary Einstein rings, which I link here, or Mm. evidence of a gravitational lens, okay? Which they describe now in the the, uh, detailed description of this thing. So what that means is that there are light sources, well behind the galactic cluster that are sending light or some uh, something like light or some form of light towards us. But this great massive thing is in the way and it bends the light, mm-hmm. okay? And <laughs> distorts the image. And that accounts for these archy looking things. Um, so, and it actually has a lensing effect and has the effect of revealing the stuff in the background that you might otherwise not be able to see. And so in fact, mm. this, because of its, because it's amazing to start with, and also because of that lensing effect, some of these faint objects back here are light that is over 13 billion years old. <laughs> Now, the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. And for the first several hundred thousand years, there was nothing. There was no mass, right? Stuff hadn't gotten together. So this is going back almost to the origin of the universe. Hmm. Wow. It's amazing. So we need to feel, well, I don't think insignificant because we have our own sort of significance, humbled, you know? And let's not waste our time on silly stuff, okay? Because there's so much cool stuff. And this is one of the coolest. This, this image, this 723, it says, this slice covers a patch of sky the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and there's thousands. He says, uh, uh, you know, Andrew points out to me, he says, each one of those little dots, that's a galaxy yeah. at least. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's not just a star. It's a galaxy. <laughs> this, uh, uh, this is a learning moment for astronomy, oh, isn't man. it? Oh yeah. These guys Very must be cool. going bonkers. There's another, the Southern Ring Nebula uh, is, is interesting. And there's two different images there taken with two different infrared cameras. And if you look at the one on the right, you can see that that nebula at its center actually has two suns, two Mm -hmm. stars. Okay. And I don't know that they have been able to uh, image that properly before. I think the most beautiful one is this first one, the Carina nebula. It's just glorious. I remember when I was in college thinking I was being so cool by taking one of the Hubble images and making it my computer background. <laughs> um, so I feel like I need to go through these and pick one to, yeah. for a computer background now. Very cool. And, and this be is so only the more. beginning. Yeah, yeah exactly. Just the beginning. Cool. Neat. Well, I'm going to bring you back to Earth. <laughs> <laughs> my pick is uh, is actually a pest, but I think it's kind of interesting. The spotted lantern fly here 
in the Northeast, this is an issue. So what is this? It is a <clears throat> invasive species, really. I mean, everything is invasive at some point, but this is a new one, which was first found in Pennsylvania in 2014, and it, it seems to have come from China. And it's a pest. Birds don't eat it because they've never seen it before and they don't take risks on stuff they've never seen before. So mm. these things, we've got them all over the everywhere. place. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. Right? So hmm. We start with eggs, egg masses on the tree, and then they hatch and they become the black and white instar nymph. So I see these all the time. They're black with white spots all over them. And then you can have the fourth instar, which is red with white spots, very pretty looking. Uh, and then we have uh, the adult lanternfly, uh, which has wings and they're folded or sometimes the wings are extended and are very colorful. But these tend to be on trees uh, or plants in masses. And there's more than one usually. And I see them every time I go outside to look around. And so they are um, at, they're putting many kinds of plants at risk. For example, um, maple trees, oak trees, cherries, grapes, hops, pine trees, plums, sycamores, walnut, willow. Um, and uh, it's destroying them because it has no, no predators. They so eat far, the leaves? That's a good question. What do they actually do? I Do. thought they were eating more like stems. But Says I'm not it feeds on a sure. wide range of fruit, ornamental, and woody trees. Yeah. I feel like I usually see them on stems. I um, see them on stems in our garden. We see them on stems. Yes, I, and I, can you actually the idea, see the effects on the trees? I have not uh, seen the effects on the trees. I just know that there are a lot of messages out there that if you see any of these, you are to kill them immediately yes. on site. Kill them. Um, <laughs> because they are so difference. damaging. So here are some signs and symptoms. Plants that ooze or weep have a fermented odor, buildup of sticky fluid on plants and on the ground underneath, sooty mold on infested plants. Uh, so this is in 11 different states uh, and you're supposed to... Uh, you know, reported, but in New Jersey, they're everywhere. So it's not really an issue. Um, and you have to try not to carry them around. So a lot of people carrying plants from place to place um, will, will inadvertently carry them, the, the egg masses, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to be quite vigilant, but I see them all the time and they're just uh, everywhere. Wow. Are they, are they like a, beetle are they crunchy if you have to kill them i can't stand not, no not really <laughs> no, not they're really soft. they're soft bodied they're yeah. pretty soft yeah. um the, <laughs> the nymphs um can be relatively easy to identify and to catch um and if you say have a lot of friends with small children um it's a great activity for small children at a barbecue oh I we just, used to I've, do that with japanese beetles yeah yeah yeah. Which which are now all over too, but everyone just, you know. But I try and, and, and get them, Brienne, on the stem and they just hop away. I haven't been uh, very, very easily getting them. But, um, you know, so far it's in 11 states, but if it gets everywhere, they say it can impact countries, grape orchard and logging industries because they're destroying um, those. And they can spread easily on, on materials containing egg masses. So it's pretty uh, scary. So what we need are birds that aren't quite such picky eaters. That's right. That's Old exactly birds. right. Some yeah. bird will figure it out. Yeah, that's what I guess happens. A bird figures it out, and that bird has more food, so its offspring are, are more fit, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to but, figure out what its natural predators are. And I'm looking on the Wikipedia page about possible pest control, and mm -hmm. it looks dismal. A few natural predators have been identified in China, but are not yet used in biocontrol. Some kind of wasps, mm. a couple kind of wasps. Yeah. It says that yeah. praying mantises are predators. That's good. We don't have many of those. Anyway, watch out we for need them. We need a bacula, get rid of them. Yeah, oh, indeed. And further down in this Wikipedia article, they're, they're, the adults are bigger than I pictured. They're, they look like... I don't know. They look like they're about an inch long. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, but, yeah. you know, you go outside, we see them all over the, trees tr the tree trunks, you know. 
just masses of them, right, Brianne? Mm-hmm. Many, many together. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a picture of a tree trunk here. <clears throat> We have two listener wow. picks today. Uh, Anne writes, since many of Kathy and Rich's picks are often space-related, I think they and all two of listeners would enjoy reading this piece from the Wall Street Journal written by Ben Cohen, a reporter colleague of my son at the Wall Street Journal, about how Greg Robinson turned the James Webb Telescope, a $10 billion debacle, into a groundbreaking scientific mission. The link is below. But the Wall Street Journal has a paywall, so I'm cutting and pasting the article as well. It's a great story. Ben's column titled The Science of Success is New and aims to reveal the hidden figures, unlikely forces, and market shifts behind the news as it aims to answer a big question. Why do people, companies, and ideas succeed or fail? Here's his column. It's an observatory so powerful it makes the Hubble Space Telescope look like a pair of binoculars. It's currently one million miles away from Earth on a spectacular adventure in outer space as part of a mission with potential to change the way we think about life itself. And uh, But first, the James Webb Telescope had to work. There's a huge distance between success and failure, said Thomas Zerbuchen, the head of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, and only a few actions that move you from one to the other. Release of the first images from Webb next week, which is now, will represent a groundbreaking moment for a project decades in the making. And the people most excited to see them are the ones who suspected they never would. Webb hovered for years much closer to the wrong end of the spectrum between failure and success. It cost so much and was delayed for so long that the mission was nearly canceled several times. But for all the scientific brain power and engineering ingenuity devoted to Webb, one of the few actions that made a difference was something else altogether. Actually, it was someone. We think of Neil Armstrong when we think about NASA's greatest triumphs. We should think of Greg Robinson, too. Hmm. That can't be the whole article. No, no it's no. not. No, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's a teaser. That's a teaser, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Sonrisa writes, I enjoyed this immensely and thought that other listeners might as well and that Alan might really appreciate this if he hasn't heard it or we- already. William Longwish is interviewed about flight, and they discuss why you can't fly if you can't see, how instrumentation has changed that, and how instinct can be dangerous for a pilot. Gives a link to this. Before William became a decorated national correspondent for The Atlantic and an international correspondent for Vanity Fair, he was a professional pilot and flight instructor. Like his writer and pilot father, Wolfgang, author of the benchmark book for aviators called Stick and Rubber, William has also written some of the most lyrical and oft-quoted texts on the beauty, risk, and technical minutia of modern flying. From his personal experience in the cockpit, he takes us through the mystery and deceptive character of the maneuver whose gradual mastery by pilots made the world small. The banking turn. (laughs) Cool. You know, it's stuff like that that's great yeah. when you when you learn. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was hard to do, <laughs> and now <laughs> it's essential, right? Thank you, thank you, Sonrisa, and thank you, uh, Anne, as well for your picks. And that will do it for Twiv nine one nine. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twiv. Send your questions, comments, picks to twiv at microbe.tv. If you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindlers at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Brian Barker's at Drew University, BioProf Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It's great to be here. And soon we will be in the other Madison, <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of Twiv and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral.